The reconnaissance phase. I can see you, but you can't see me. So as we look at the hacker's methodology, you'll remember that the first step we have is reconnaissance. And we talked about the fact that we spend about 80 to 90% of our time in this phase before we actually begin our exploitation. During phase one, we're going to perform reconnaissance. This is our systematic attempt to locate, gather, identify, and record information about our target. This is also known as footprinting. And this is a passive collection technique. We'll do things like using open source research and internet searches like Google, We'll use social engineering, dumpster diving, and email harvesting to collect as much information as we can about the organization before we start targeting the organization for an actual exploit. So what types of information are we desiring? Well, we're going to gather any information we can, but the things we're really focused on are things like phone numbers, contact names, email addresses, security-related information, information systems that are being utilized, things like if we know if they're using Windows or Linux, job postings, and resumes. So job postings and resumes may seem like an odd thing to collect. But the reason why we collect job postings is there's a lot of information that we'll find there. For instance, if I was going after this company, Technical Innovations, I look at some of their job postings. In this one, there's a system administrator job. And I start looking at the knowledge and skills and abilities. They're looking for somebody who has 2000 or 2003 Microsoft certifications. That tells me they're probably running Windows Server 2000 or Windows Server 2003, opening up a whole world of exploits to me. They're using Unix or Linux and HP Blade systems. Again, that's information that we can find useful as we go through our exploitation. Further down, we see again, there's Windows servers. They keep popping up, Windows workstations, Windows servers. That's going to help me start mapping out what that network might look like, so I can start figuring out what kind of attacks I want to generate. And finally, they mentioned shift work is required. Now, what does that tell me as an attacker? Well, if shift work is required, that means that there's people in the building most likely 24 hours a day. So if I was going to try to break in from a physical standpoint, Doing it in the overnight hours may not be as effective as I thought it might be. Because they're doing shift work, there's people there, people can therefore catch me. I want to be more careful when I do that, and I'll have to start developing that pattern of life a little bit better, so I'll know when the shift changes happen, and when people are or are not at work. Some shifts only work two shift, in which case they might work 16 hours of the day, leaving 8 hours exposed. Others work shift work, where it's 24 hour coverage. These are the things we're going to have to figure out by looking at that pattern of life before we start an exploit. Because one of the exploits we can do is actually doing physical break-ins if that's within the scope of our assessment. So the second thing we're going to look at here is resumes. Now, resumes may be helpful. There's a couple of reasons. One is if I'm searching for the name of a company and I pull up somebody's resume, I may find an employee who used to work there who may not be happy with their job. I can find out information from them. Secondly, I can look at the type of skills of the people that they've hired before. So while I look at this professional summary and the technical proficiencies, that's interesting, but not necessarily too helpful. But when I get to the second page of his resume, I can see that he has his professional experience and educational and training. In this case, I can see that ABC Energy Company that he worked at hired him as a Linux system administrator. He had over 200 Linux systems. He had Red Hat and SUSE Linux. That's going to help me narrow down my scope of exploitation. Additionally, they use VMware. So that tells me that they're using virtualized environments. So even if I break into a single box, I'm going to have to find a way to break out of that box and into the other boxes. That can be difficult. So these are things I want to start looking at. Additionally, he did a migration effort of Windows servers over to Red Hat version 4. Now I know the exact version that they were running, at least during the time he was there. And as you can see in the resume, he is presently employed there. So that would tell me something else. He also has incorporated that into a 2003 Windows Server Active Directory domain. So again, as I'm attacking, I go, oh, he's got Windows Server 2003. Let me look at exploits that can break those vulnerabilities. The next thing I see is that he's using Citrix MetaFrame. So with Citrix, that's another client that we would be using, and we can start targeting vulnerabilities against Citrix if we couldn't get in through Windows or Linux. Lots of different options as I go through this guy's resume and figure out where those vulnerabilities are for this organization. So what are some tools we use in reconnaissance? Well, there's lots of tools that exist. We can use things like NSLOOKUP, TRACEROUTE, PING, WHOIS, DOMAIN DOSSIER, EMAIL DOSSIER, GOOGLE, SOCIAL NETWORKING, DISCOVER, and MLTGO, just to name a few. I'm going to briefly talk about each of these as we keep going. And in our labs, we're going to actually play with a couple of these tools as we do a mock reconnaissance phase. The first one we're going to talk about is NSLOOKUP. Now, NSLOOKUP stands for Name Server Lookup, and it resolves a fully qualified domain name to an IP address. For example, if you have my website name, jasondion.com, computers don't understand that. They understand numbers. So if I did an NSLOOKUP of jasondion.com, I'll get back the IP address of my server. In this case, 205.172.19.193.
This is what we call non-interactive mode. I give it the command and I give it the website and it will give me the information back. There is also an interactive mode. In interactive mode, you just type nslookup and then hit enter. This brings you up into the interactive mode. At this point, you can set certain types and modifiers. For example, on the screen here you see I set type to MX. That stands for mail records. By doing this, I can search for the mail records associated with YouTube.com. As you see there, I got those mail exchangers displayed to the screen. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of different options for NSLOOKUP. And if you want to learn more about it, I'd recommend going and searching NSLOOKUP on the web. You'll get all the details you'll need. For the ethical hacker exam, you will have to know several of these modifiers. For our reconnaissance efforts, because we're going to be limited in scope in our reconnaissance, because we're using a virtualized lab, you won't need to know these in depth. Now another thing I want to mention here is when you do NSLOOKUP, you're actually doing a lookup from your attack platform, in our case Kali Linux, to a DNS server to get that information. If you, Again, if you want to do this anonymously, there's lots of good tools out on the web. One of my favorites is centralops.net. We'll play with that during our labs as well, and this will help us remain passive longer during our reconnaissance phase. So if we use centralops.net, here's an example of what that would look like. You fill in the blanks in the web page, you hit go, and on the right side you'll see our answers came back. You can see that for jasondion.com I was able to find the A record, which is its address, their IP address. I also found its name servers, which can help me if I'm going to do a DNS attack, and I found its mail servers as well. The next tool we're going to talk about is Traceroute. And Traceroute displays the path between your device, our Kali workstation, and the destination IP address showing each router hop along the way. So every time I find a router or a firewall, it's going to display that route. For instance, if you do traceroute and the IP address, you'll get those routes in between. If you do traceroute and the domain name, such as google.com, you'll be able to see all the routers and firewalls between your computer and google.com. So the way traceroute works is it's going to increase your time to live for every time you send out a packet. So it's going to send out three packets with a time to live of one. It'll go one hop and then fail and send back an error message. Then it will send out the next three packets with a time to live of two. They'll go two hops and report back with an error message, and it will keep doing this until it reaches the destination. This allows it to know exactly how many hops it takes, how long each hop takes to get there, and which route it took through the network. Each time a packet passed through a host, a router, or a firewall, it will decrease the time to live by one and forward the packet on. When that reaches a time to live of zero, it will actually produce a type 11 error and that packet will be sent back to the sender. Now as it does this and it goes through all of the hops, it's collecting all of this data back with the time to live and it'll combine that into the report for you to see. Three timestamp values are returned for each host along the path and this is actually the delay in the latency it takes. So you can actually determine how long it took to get from my computer all the way to Google and the particular route it took. Now what does latency tell you? It can tell you what kind of connection the people have. So for instance, if they have a dial-up modem, I know this is really old but some places still do, uh, you'll have a longer latency, 100 to 150 milliseconds. If you have cellular, it's somewhere around 50 to 150 milliseconds. If you're using satellite, you'll have a very high latency, around 6 to 700 milliseconds. If you're using fiber optic, it'll be a very low latency, 5 to 40 milliseconds. So you'll be able to tell that as you're doing this trace route and it can start giving you some more information about the victim you're going after. And here's just an example of what a trace route output looks like. So for instance, here you see traceroutejasondion.com. You'll see the first gateway, 10.0.2.2. You'll see a couple of series of stars. That's usually a firewall that's not reporting back, but it knows there's something there. And then it continues on through all of the routers. In this case, starting at hawaii.rr.com and going all the way down to unifiedlayer.com, which is my hosting provider. Again, going back to centralops.net, they have great tools for us. We can do the same trace route there. And again, that keeps us at that arm's reach. We're not actually touching the server we're going to. We're doing it from central ops server to the victim, not from our computer to the victim in this case. Next, we're going to talk about ping. And ping is actually used to check the IP connectivity between two network devices. And we often use this in network troubleshooting, but we can also use it in our hacking efforts. So with Linux, ping is actually going to go until it's terminated. When you use it on Windows, it only does a count of four. So we can do ping and the domain name or ping in the IP address and it will start telling us is that distant end up. We use this often in what's called a ping sweep where we'll start pinging an entire range of networks to find out who is up and who is down in that range of IP addresses. Here's an example where I'm pinging again my server jasondion.com. I did it for a count of six and you'll see that it responded. It sent out 64 bytes each time. It responded back with the IP address and the time to live decreased by one and the time of how long it took, in this case, about 99 milliseconds. 
And once again, we can go back to central ops and do this from an arm's length distance. We can do it the same way. We'll tell the domain we want to go to or the IP address, how long to wait for a timeout, how many hops is too many, how many packets to send, and the data size. It'll do that information and pop back the display as you see on the right of your screen. The next tool we have is what's called Whois. And what Whois does is it provides us information on the domain name owner. So we can get things like the server address, the owner's name, their physical address, their phone numbers, and how to contact them. Why might this be helpful to us? We can use this to develop a successful social engineering attack against them. For example, if we know who their web hosting provider is, we can craft an email to the owner of the domain that says, your website domain is going to expire. Click here to renew. And if they click there, we can use that as a way to get into their networks. So here's just a simple who is command, who is jasondion.com, and up it pops with the information. It tells me the name servers and some basic information, such as when it does expire. If I want to get more details, I would go to internic.net, and I could put in the domain name there, or again, we can go to Central Ops. And Central Ops has what's called a domain dossier. Domain dossier will actually give us the who is record for the domain and the network, the DNS records like we talked about before, the trace route, which we've talked about before, and the addition of a service scan. We can run all of these from Central Ops Server, keeping us more anonymous. There's also another function there called the email dossier. And the email dossier is actually going to provide us those mail records we looked at before. It'll do email address validation for us. And we can get the IP and server addresses for those emails, as well as an SMTP connection log. So in this example, I have titancypher at gmail.com. This is an email I use with a lot of hacking competitions for my students. If you notice here, we can go in there, click go, and we'll see what we get. In this case, we see that it has a confidence rating of 3, which says that this passed a validation of the email. It is a real email address. We could see the MX records, and then on the right side, you'll see the SMTP session, where the server from Central Ops actually talked to Google Server to validate that that was a good email address. And you can see the commands that were run there. Another wonderful resource we have is Google. Now, I know this seems like it's obvious, but there's a lot of information on the Internet that's just open source. We can use Google to search press releases, corporate websites, and everything else at once. And the way you craft your commands in Google can really help you become more efficient as you search for this information. There have been numerous books written about Google hacking, including adding things like the file types or adding or subtracting keywords using pluses and minuses and operators and or operators. There's lots of ways to do what we call Google hacking and just getting a really good, well-crafted search so that you can find the information you want quickly. What can we find through Google? Well, let's get an example of a PowerPoint file or an Excel file. I can search for that company name and a file type of XLS. That'll pop back every spreadsheet that it can find in Google. I can take one of those, embed malware, and send it out to an employee as part of a spear phishing campaign. It's going to look legitimate because it was a real file from the company and it has real information from the company, but I gave them just a little something extra, which is how I can get myself into the network. Social media. So we all love our social media, but it is truly a treasure trove of information. We have things like Facebook and LinkedIn, Google+, Twitter, Pinterest, Tumblr, and many others. This is really useful in doing social engineering campaigns and spear phishing campaigns against employees, and we can really target who we want. For example, if I can find out that the receptionist has a child at a particular middle school, I can send emails crafted as if I'm from the middle school. If I go to LinkedIn, I can find resumes and history. If I go to Google+, Plus, I might find some things about what people like to do in their off time, and I can use that to create patterns of life. Again, these are all different ways that we can start getting more and more information to figure out how we want to attack this network. One of the tools we're going to use in our lab is what's called Creepy. And what Creepy allows us to do is go after networks like Google+, Plus and Twitter. We can actually put in a username or keywords, and it will find the tweets and the Google+, Plus entries associated with those. For example, we're going to use Titan Cipher, which again is that made-up account that I have, and there's a Twitter account associated with it. We can go and pull all of the tweets that that person has made. We can geolocate them and start establishing pattern of life, time of day, and where they are and what they do. The next tool is one that comes inside of Kali Linux. It's stored in the scripts folder, and it is a tool written by Lead Bard. It's called Discover. Discover combines many information gathering tools with a single script that gives you a menu-driven interface. You can run discover.sh, which is a shell script to start the script, and then we can start going through and doing different things with it, such as our recon for our domain, our person, or our sales force. We can do scanning. We can use IceWeasel to search websites. We can crack Wi-Fi passwords. There's a lot of tools. There's about 15 or 20 tools all shoved into this Discover script, and it makes your job much easier. And finally, we get to Maltigo. Maltigo is a graphical tool 
that allows you to do some basic enumeration and reconnaissance. It kind of combines some of our step one and step two steps of the hacker's methodology. Some things we can do is DNS, who is, we can search network blocks and IP addresses, and we can target individuals. Now the thing I really like about Meltigo is it does a really good job of visually depicting the relationships between people, information, and the networks they utilize. So for example, as I'm starting to build a network map based on all the enumeration I'm doing, I can start putting that in and start getting a feel for what it looks like. Meltigo does a great job. It also can do things based on interactions, kind of like social media. If you think about the old seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, if I know Joe and Joe knows Mary, then I know Mary by two steps removed. Maltigo will start showing you those relationships. By building that, it will help me craft better social engineering campaigns and better exploitation. Maltigo is also included as part of Kali Linux. So how do we put all this together? Well, at this point, we've collected examples of emails, names, phone numbers, server addresses, documents, presentations, and much more. We've even gotten PDF files and Word files and Excel and PowerPoint, and we can embed malware into those. We can use real employee names, positions, and writing styles to mimic their emails. We can take all that and conduct a really realistic spear phishing attack. Or, if I have a domain name, for instance, I own titancipher.com for my hacking competitions, I could also buy titancipher with a y.com. Now, if I have that one, I can use that as a watering hole. I can make it look just like the original titancipher.com, but embed malware in there. That way, when people come to go to titancipher.com, if they mistype it, they go to the incorrect site. So, for instance, if you had Google with three O's instead of two O's, or Yahoo with three O's instead of two O's, something like that will allow us to have similar domain names that people can get mistyped and go over to us. Also, we can identify subdomains. If we find developer sites or mail servers, those are possible keys for exploitation, especially if we can find something like a developer site, because developer sites tend to run beta software as they're developing things, which means they have more bugs and more vulnerabilities. These are just some of the ways that we can find a foothold into the network. Next, we're going to put some of these tools in action, and we're going to play with them in the lab environment.